great idea. Matt, I'm tired and I want to go home. Besides, Halloween Havoc is about to start. Look, you have been picking houses all night long. Now it's my turn. Yeah, that's only because we ended up with two pieces of last year's Christmas fruitcake from the last one you picked. Yeah! Whatever house you pick better be good. Good? You want good? This will be better than good. This one will be great. And I want that! <laughs> Babies or something? This place ain't that bad. Well, look at it, Matt. It looks like it's haunted. Let's just go home and watch Halloween Havoc and forget all about this one. We've got plenty of candy already. Well, well, who cares about candy? I came here to see something scary. like to have some what kind are they only a kind a mother could make why don't you come inside and have a bite of her cookies we have enough treats already we came here to see something scary you want to see something scary i'll show you something scary Kids want a little fright in your night, huh? Gee, Mrs. Shivani, how did you get up there so fast? Don't you kids know? All things are possible on All Hallows' Eve. Frightening. Chilling things like spin the wheel, make the deal. Just one haunting spin will lock Cactus Jack and Vader in combat when it lands on one of its many ghoulish haunting matches. That's not gonna be scary. If you can't come up with something better than that, we are leaving. Okay, okay, I've had it, all right? You guys wanna be really scared? Get a load of this. Welcome in to another edition of the Retro Wrestling Rewind. As always, I am David Fine, alongside Alex G. Man, that intro that I just played was from 1993, Halloween Havoc. That was a very creepy introduction by one Tony Schiavone. You ever want to punch a little kid in the face? That little fucking bastard, everyone should know who I'm talking about. 
I want to punch him right in the fucking face. What a dick. Why do you say that? He was just such an obnoxious little kid. But did you see that uh, kind of creepy child um, abductor, child molester, uh, um, a grin that Tony should... I'm, I know he's not, but I mean, well, yeah, I, mean, I guess not. Um, that was just weird. He said he improvised. That was just... The weird. smile he improvised, for and, sure. And, and you know, he kept on referring to his wife. You know, she was cooking... You know, or what? You know, it's just like, oh my god! It's like, She's baking cookies. And you, you can, know. why don't you eat the cookies? Eat her well, cookies. I mean, I, I would have if I had an opportunity to, probably. Yeah, I mean, have you ever actually seen what Louis Shivani looks like? I have. Well, anyway, but we're yeah. looking at Halloween Havoc 1990, motherfucking three. First and foremost. This, for me, is a toss-up between being the best wrestling pay-per-view of 1993. It's either this or Star K 93. Take your pick. This show is fucking dope, first and foremost. And before we, we, we deep dive into this, right? Before we deep dive into this, that intro might be the best produced vignette that WCW had done to that point and maybe for the rest of their existence. It was WWF level. Of, uh, of production there. So kudos to anyone who pulled that and was involved in that uh, vignette beginning of the show. Uh, I'm pretty sure Tony ate those kids, though. So Yeah, it was, uh, it was rather weird. And he killed those kids, 1,000%. But, 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 but this is knee-deep in the Eric Bischoff era of WCW. This is the time, probably a little bit earlier, probably over the summer, WCW for me was number one. And WWF was taking a back seat. I was entrenched. I was all in to turn a phrase on WCW during this time frame. Up until I would say like 1998 almost, 1999 maybe. You know, WCW was my number one. I was like the only kid in New York who liked who liked WCW over WWF. Yeah, I mean it's but it it was definitely uh, you could definitely see it was. You know, knee deep in um, Eric Bischoff. Because the production is much better. The building looked fantastic. Yeah. But did you see what the hell Eric Bischoff had on? He looked like a fucking wild out Southern boy. He had the fucking like generals like Custer uniform on. And no, he's definitely he's definitely dressed as a Confederate soldier, which is but, which is hilarious. But did you notice? Um, you know, I Jeff, wonder if they because uh, I think didn't I, I want to say Cornette dressed like that too. Yeah, he, maybe in ninety, I would say. I'm uh, he, pretty sure one of the years. I'm pretty sure he did. He, I mean, he probably. So they might have they might have brushed that off and, and kind of uh, took it in for for, for uh, Eric Bischoff. He, he probably did. I mean, but did you see or did you hear um, Jesse Ventura's? Uh, he 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 said he was a he was um, New or. or um, Bourbon Street's a number one gynecologist. He did. I was like, really? This is also the show where he calls Missy Hyde a prostitute, which is nice. I mean, I call a spade a spade. I mean, I'm just saying. Oh, I wouldn't call her. Uh, no, she's all the way live, especially on this show. Yeah, she is. So this is this is knee deep in the Eric Bischoff era. And I want to take a couple of minutes out to kind of talk about the gotta, Eric Bischoff era. You got to unpack some WCW. stuff. WCW. Which is, I think, it's very important, very underrated. I know he kind of downplays this particular time frame from when he first takes over from Watts up until he gets uh, the town of Hulk Hogan. But this is, for me, like the best WCW. Like, there's fresh guys all over the place. There's a couple of big stars. We don't get all the WWF rejects yet. Uh, we have Root on top with Flair. You have Sting. You have Sid. You have Davy Boy Smith. You have Lord Steven Regal. You have Steve Austin and Dustin Rhodes, Barry Windham still in the mix, Arn Anderson still in the mix here. And I thought their talent roster was fantastic. I'm pretty sure Dusty's booking at this point. Um, but I think, for me, I'm a big Eric Bischoff fan. Now, I'm not a stan. Now, now the Twitter uses this term called stan, right, which I think is ridiculous because I don't stand for anyone because I'm a grown-ass fucking man and I'm not fucking weird about my shit. But I do have a level of respect for Eric Bischoff and a level of admiration for him. I've met him in person. He's very, very cordial, very nice. But for me, the, the amazing part about Eric's story that I find most fascinating is how he went from being the third string announcer, the she show announcer, and his path to navigate the corporate uh, structure of Turner uh, 
broadcasting, which which is an amazing feat to me. And if anyone who's ever dealt in the corporate world, I've spent quite a bit of time in the corporate world and I've had dinner and, and lunches with CEOs and, and such. And when you get to that upper management, trying to have a conversation with these people are, are, are pretty ridiculous uh, because they're not normal people. You know what I mean? They're just, they're just, they're really, really weird, a little bit of aloof. And they're just strange all around. And, and for Eric to come out of literally out of nowhere and rise to the through the ranks and, and finally get WCW pointed in the right direction in, the, in, the, in an area where many people have failed prior to that and get him up to a point where Ted's ready to open up the checkbook and start you know really putting some money behind it is an amazing story all on his own. Now, you know, we'll talk about you know, we get into like 96, 97, and maybe some of that stuff went to his head and the company you know, smiled out of control. But I'll say this. If Eric Bischoff, WCW, didn't get as big as they gotten, WCW might still be around. I think there was a lot of, a lot of in the corporate structure of TBS, they had issues with the fact that WCW was the number one most rated show on their network. And I think a lot of people took issue with that. And I know, you know, when you talk about corporations, I think a lot of WCW's losses were the other departments and the corporations were just funneling the money they lost in the WCW. Because that $60 million number that's been touted seems like quite a bit for a professional wrestling uh, product, especially even though some of those contracts were very, very high. $60 million doesn't seem like a lot. And I know they had to fix problems where, like, WCW was not getting any of the money generated from like home video or pay per view, and some of the other merchandising they were doing. So that wasn't that wasn't counted for them. And Eric was able to fix those issues, but now they're starting to get credit for that money. So on paper, you know, his department, which was WCW, was looking much much better to the point where you know Ted was you know I'm going to compete. Let's throw some money behind us. Let's get Hulk Hogan and and do a lot more things. And yeah, I give Eric credit for that. Um, it's funny about when you talk about TBS and TNT. Now we've gone over the last 19 years with no wrestling on any Turner networks, which has been the longest because wrestling has been a staple of the Turner network or family of networks since literally the beginning. And it's, I'm glad to see that you know, TNT and and Turner finally brought wrestling back to their network. Now, I can make an argument because of the rivalry between Turner and Fox that's always been there. And it starts out with Ted Turner and Rupert Murdoch and has gone on from CNN to Fox News. And now, hey, Fox gets smacked down and all of a sudden, hey, Turner wants to get a wrestling program on their TV. Maybe that's something to do with it. Maybe not. But I do find that very, very interesting. The whole AEW thing is is is, is interesting to me because I almost feel like, and I don't think anyone talks about this, that Vince opens up a brand new football league and then all of a sudden the son of the owner of a national football league team, Nashville Jaguars, wants to open up a wrestling company. I find that strange. And a lot of people say, you know, you're, you're, you're grasping at straws. That's conspiracy theorists. You got to understand how these upper management millionaires and billionaires think. There's a lot of ego involved there as well. So I just want to keep that in mind. But again, this is the best show of 1993. It's either this or Starcade for any wrestling promotion in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean speaking of... Speaking of the uh, XFL, uh, you catch any of the games this past weekend? On uh, I saw some highlights. I wasn't going to go. You know, I'm. Listen, I used to be a big football fan, right? And my team is the New York Jets, right? I'm not a football fan anymore. Ever since the butt fumble, I literally took my controller and I threw it against the wall and I smashed it into a million pieces. And at that point, I was like, I'm, I'm resorting to violence here. Maybe I shouldn't watch anymore. So I really haven't watched football since. Will I watch the XSFL? You know, their kickoff looks interesting. You know, some of the plays look pretty good. It seems all right. 
Uh, no issues with it so far. So this team is pretty good. So I might check out a game or two. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, this uh, probably. I mean, I, I if I'm you know, if I'm uh, not uh, doing something, I may check it out and you know may uh, catch the highlights like you did. But I mean, this pay per view is October twenty fourth, nineteen ninety three. That was the day before my birthday. Oh. It happened in New Orleans, Louisiana at the Lakefront Arena. The grand total of 6,000 were in attendance. 3,000 paid, by the way. So, so that means 3,000 3, uh, were comped or, you know, given tickets. Yeah. I mean, overall, I mean, I, th- I thought it was a, 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 uh, a, good, a good show. I mean, the, it, it was funny. Okay, so I, I'm not, give me a history of Harlem Heat. They were Kane and Cole at, uh, for you know Harlem Heat. This this uh, pay per view. When did they s- decide to go with Booker T, and Stevie Ray? I mean, it's it I wasn't mean, too much longer. Um, so what happened was when they first got brought out, they got brought out in chains, like they were like from, from prison, and and you had Robert Parker as their manager, and and yeah, even in 1993, they're like, ah, we really shouldn't do this. So. They made the adjustment to them. They went with their actual name, Steve Ray and uh, Booker T, which would, had been their names when they were the Ebony Experience and then Global anyway. Yeah, I mean that, that that just, I mean that's just a bad fucking idea. I mean, it's, I'm sorry. I mean, Stevie where Wonder. Was, can where where that. was standard and practices for WCW on this one? Like they dropped the ball. Yeah, though they dropped the they dropped the ball ma- majorly. It's just like, it's just weird. But yeah, I mean th- this opening match we had Ice Train, Charlie Norris, and the Shockmaster Uncle Fred taking on Harlem Heat, Kane Cole, and the Equalizer. I mean, not the Shockmaster. Sorry, not the Shock. The Equalizer. Yeah. No, you uh, had it right. Yeah, yeah. It was Ice Train, Charlie Norris, and the Shockmaster. The Shockmaster, his gimmick has changed. Okay. And I don't think really Ovi really yeah. liked it all that much. And you had Equalizer, who would later on become Dave Sullivan here. Or even again, this is a opening card match. You're, they're trying to do some stuff with Ice Train. They're trying to do some stuff with Charlie Norris here. You know, Ice Train doesn't really go anywhere. He does some cool stuff with Scott Norton, and then um, he turns heel uh, late into the Nitro era. Charlie Norris doesn't really, you know, he retires not too long after this. He's he's around for a couple more years. Again, a guy that. Mm, He's not that good. And Shockmaster, Shockmaster, again, when you're looking at this match, you're looking at Harlem Heat like those guys are the future for sure. You know, they're kind of in here with like, you know, these are these are lower mid-card guys. Like Ice Train's pretty fresh in here from the uh, Atlanta Indies. So, you know, overall, it's a fine match. You get to showcase Harlem Heat a little bit. I prefer Dave Sullivan over the Equalizer. Ice Train is someone that, you look at someone like Ice Train, and he's one of these guys I like to put in the bucket of main event or bust, right? Yeah. Because you can't have Ice Train in the middle card being TV champion. It's just not going to work. He's either someone that you're going to put in the main event. And I think the name, the Ice Train, actually hurts him. Could you imagine WCW world champion, the Ice Train? No, that's not going to work. No. He, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's just a terrible – I mean, yeah, we're definitely not – yeah, they would have to repackage him and give him a – Like, guys, if you're entering a major promotion, or not even a major promotion, but any promotion out there, if you'd be you know, you're heading into Ring of Honor, you're going into NXT, you're going anywhere, it's like your name is very important because you want to be able to hear Howard Finkel in your head. I know he doesn't announce it anymore, but Howard Finkel in your head saying, so-and-so, the new world heavyweight champion. And if it sounds ridiculous, like you can't, like your name can't be the backstabber. That's just not going to work. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, I, mean, it's, it's, I think sometimes they don't. I mean, people, you know, of the course, equalizer, they, WCW World Champion. No, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, no, and the Shockmaster, your new W. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred might work. Yeah, man. Although even Tugboat is ridiculous too. Imagine Tugboat. WWF World Champion Tugboat. Like yeah. I know his original name was Tugboat Thomas. Even that is fucking ridiculous. Tugboat in general was ridiculous. I'm more of a typhoon man myself. Yeah, I mean, and, spe- and speaking of uh, Tugboat, Uncle Fred, uh, the Shockmaster, um, he's going to be uh, coming up on the program uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, going to be sitting down talking with him, uh, kind of just 
you know, kind of just, you know, uh, you know, talking. Ask him why Ole Anderson hated him so much and made him a truck driver. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. Okay, oh. Where the fuck he was? Oh, he was the man. Yo, when he turned fucking heel on fucking uh, on fucking Andre and shit. Yeah. And they like the the formation of the fucking national disaster. Actually, he turned heel on the on the uh, bushwhackers, but that was with the whole Andre thing. That was dope as fuck. I didn't really like them as a baby face. I do. I do like Earthquake John Tenza as a baby face by himself. But that was really, really cool stuff. And that was probably, you know, Fred Ottman at his best at, as Typhoon. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's and, big and, natural disasters, man. Personally. Yeah, I, I, I'm a natural disasters. I, I love, you know, uh, it's it's kind of funny how back in the old WWF days they would have you know the Twin Towers. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would definitely not be. PC today. Um, no. No, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's, I, I, I think, I, I think they squashed it real fast right before 9 11. They were having a terrorist, I think they were going to have like a terrorist gimmick or something. No, that was before it was the London, the London, uh, oh, the I guess London. subway bombing. Okay. They did the whole thing where like jihadists like beat the shit out of the Undertaker. God, GM, well, sp- uh, God, um, I'm sure you're happy. To- Again, there's a pre 9 11 and post 9 11. Like, we talk about terrorists and, and foreign fanatics. And, like, once that thing happened, and I live in New York, so it affected many, many people around me, including myself. Like, that shit wasn't funny anymore. Like, you can't, ha- you can't have, like, the goofy, silly terrorist or. or or foreign people, or, or even an anti-American sentiment like that anymore. It wasn't going to work. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it, it you know, you know, nine eleven affected you know us in everyday things, and it's just it's just weird how it you know it affects us in things we don't think about. You know, something that's supposed to be fun, you know, kind of lighthearted or whatever. Like you remember Luke Van Borger, right? He was an anti-American character from Finland. Do we have beef with Finland? No, no, and no, the, no, and then like you know, and uh, all the yeah, these these anti-American. I mean, I mean, I'm just you know, it's that just, shit wasn't gonna work anymore because like that anti-American shit just makes you want to just turn the channel. Yeah, you know, well, it, the thing that makes me want to turn the channel is uh, Goldberg coming back, but that's beside the point. You know, he's gonna I think he's gonna face Bray Wyatt at the the fucking you know Saudi Arabia show. It's like. That 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 just that pisses me off that they still go over there, but that's neither here nor there. But it's it's not a WCW surprise. went to North fucking Korea, which we'll talk back on the next show. Yeah, no, but which it's is oh, very similar. Yeah, 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 you're correct. The next match we had, I fucking love Paul Orndorff, but I love his second, the assassin Jody Hamilton. He's, I love Jody Hamilton. I mean, with he's that, with that, with that fucking mask, it looks like it's like squishing his face. Yeah, uh, he he's got like, like this. That pop, 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 pop. I mean, not, not. I mean, not. This is, has nothing to do with you know anything. But whenever he has that mask on, he just his eyes are just very squinty. I'm not yeah. saying that he's like Chinese or Japanese, but I don't think Jody Hamilton is Asian. <laughs> no, trust me, he is not. He is not. Took take on Ricky, or as they would call him, the Dragon Ricky Steamboat. By count now, out. Now, Paul Orndorff was a replacement for... Who was he a replacement for? Um, Yoshi Kwan. Remember Yoshi Kwan? Uh, yeah. How can you... Me yeah, neither. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but you get, a, you get a really awesome match in, in Orndorff and, and Steamboat. This is probably Orndorff's one of his last really good matches. And Steamboat is Steamboat. This match would have been fucking five stars in 1986, by the way. Yeah, but, but it is 1993. Kind of lame finish with with the count outs. A couple of lame finishes on this show. Match quality is fantastic. You have uh, the interference from the assassin here, and Polono gets the win over Ricky Steamboat by via count out. So 18 minutes they went. Yeah, I mean it, it was it was it was a good match. I mean, I, like it was a really good match. It was I'm, like like three and a half star match. Like it was really good, surprisingly yeah, good. Yeah, I mean uh, Paul Orndorff is. I mean. He, like you said, he's seen better days than 1993. But I mean, this was a good match. I mean, it's probably his last, his last really good match. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because he would have those, like, he had those matches. He had that match with fucking uh, 
with cactus that's fucking off the chain too yeah i mean god fucking i uh I uh, I wa- I saw the uh, the picture that he uh, that Mick Foley uh, signed for me at WrestleCon last year. It just brings back brings back great memories from a a, a, uh, a better time. But uh, so what, what? How old were you? When you met him? Fourteen? No, what did he do? To I you? was. Hey, I don't like to talk about that. Okay, I'm going through therapy. He gave you the man with the claw in your butt. With the sock. Uh, that's weird. Just the sock. Put the dirty sock in my mouth. Or what, I guess that was a Ooh. sock. I guess that was a sock you put in my mouth. That's, you don't know what he did with that sock anyway. It was kind of was hard. It, was it crusty? It was very oh, hard. Crusty. That's that's gross. Wow. The next match we had on the card was for the WCW World TV title. We had Lord Steven Regal with Sir William taking on Davy Boy Smith. Fucking tie. Okay. The match before was a count out. The other match, the first match, you know, it was what it was. This was a fucking time limit draw, 15 minutes. Well, I mean, I, I'm not. The, okay, so they now have a new TV champion in the National Wrestling Alliance, the Power Show. I'm not sure what they have a 20 minute time. What was up with a 15 minute time limit? I mean, was that just a thing that they just came up with? Yeah, you know, it's some. It's an old Crockett deal. It used to be something to get heat. So what happened was that it used to be 10 minutes. So if you couldn't beat the television champion, in 10, the match would keep on going. But you, you could. The win, belt yeah. was no longer on the line. Yeah, I think that happened one time. I, I, I was on one of those. They had those to push shows. it back. They had to push it. Like, that happened with Tully Blanchard and Ricky Steamboat. They would do 15 minutes. Then they would do 20 minutes. Then they would do 30 minutes. And they would do 45 up until 60. Yeah, that's how it would go. Yeah. I mean, and this is a way to, you know, it was a way to get heat. It's a way to keep the, the belt on the champion without hurting your, your baby face here. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you're not going to put the TV belt on Davey Boy Smith. Again, he's he's above that, but having to go with a time limit draw with Steve Regal elevates Regal here. Um, you do the you know do the finish where like it's the one two and oh the you know time right now, but they fucked up the finish because he had to kick out of the, uh, the power slam and then they go into that power uh, pile driver spot because the timing got fucked up. But overall, I mean, you, feel, you see how comfortable David Boy Smith was in this kind of British style match. Really good. I'm not sure if the fans knew what to think about it. But, you know, Steven Regal at this point is, like, really, really good. I like Sir William. Again, let's build on D for those of you who don't know. But I thought this match was really good. And, unfortunately, you know, Davey Boy Smith wouldn't stick around up until 1994. So, Yeah, I mean, it was – I mean, it was I, – I was – I'm still a big uh, Lord Steven Regal fan. I mean, he's still yeah. he's still in NXT. He's the general manager of the last time I, I watched NXT. He's just, he's just, he is good. He's good on the mic. He gets heat. He, he's, he's stupid underrated, right? Like he's ridiculously underrated, I think. Yeah. I mean, he was, I was not a fan when he was tagging with, um, with, uh, Bobby Eaton. I love that tag team because it's so ridiculous. The blue blood was awesome. Squire, David Taylor, the only incarnation of Steven Regal I didn't like when he was the man's man, which is weird. A little bit off putting. Yeah, I mean, he is a man's man, I'm sure, but it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, but he just, I mean, he looks like he could, he could legitimately like fight somebody. Like, like yeah, you would not want to fight him, fight him in a pub in you know in England or 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 down the street uh, in he Atlanta. He looks or, like a legit badass for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was it's definitely one of those things. Um, yeah, you know, I don't think people remember like because his turn was very sudden. Like he just came in as like Steve, like Steve Regal, like babyface. And then he found that he had royal blood, and then that's what turned him. And then he became Lord Stephen Regal, like a jackass. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like one of those things, like the Undertaker. He gets his gimmick. He he keeps it most. Of, he keeps it all of his career, most of his career. Lord Stephen Regal, he hasn't, you know, he's kept this same gimmick, not changed anything. He's still Lord Stephen Regal. It's just, I think it. If it was an, an American doing it, acting like he was a lord of you know whatever, it would be stupid. But he, you know, he's from uh, like Triple H. Yeah, well, man, that's but he's, the Connecticut Blue Blood. God, uh, which was which is was just uh, his gimmick at WCW without the French part. So he didn't have to do the stupid accent no more because he had a, even back then. I don't know if people he had a heavy, heavy Boston like his Boston accent is not there anymore. But when he first started, he had a heavy, heavy Boston accent. Yeah, and he had freaking hair like a girl. But that's yeah. My my uh, my my uh, co-host on uh, on my YouTube show trained with Triple H at Kowalski School, and if you look at one of the videos on the WWE Network chronicling the early days of Triple H, you will see him. And 
that's a great segue. And speaking of your YouTube channel, I mean, I, there's been some teases on on the YouTube channel of some stuff that's coming up on your channel. If people, you know, want to watch it, want to hear some more of your voices and hear your co-host and hear what you have to say about video games, not just wrestling, how can they get to it? Well, you know, type in uh, Retro Wrestling Games Presents or just Wrestle Wrestling Games if you want to be lazy about it. Uh, we're, we're the first thing that pops up. So we have over uh, 375 videos. So take your pick. Um, we've been uh, promoting the AWA 1990 project as I try to revive the AWA through fantasy booking. And we're going to use our Fire Pro Wrestling World as our or a game engine here to kind of give you a visual representation of what that actually will look like. Uh, we still have a couple more episodes to get through on the NWA 1984 project. So that series is uh, rapidly con uh, concluding at this point. And we have some, you know, we have some arcade. We're really going to focus on arcade video games for the first quarter of 2020. So you'll see a lot more of those pop up as we get through uh, the process here. But I think overall, I mean, check it out. You know, hit that like button, you know, subscribe, leave a comment. Just watch the show. It's really fucking good. Like, I, here's the issue, right? The issue I have is that I get about a 1,000 views per video. That's what I average, which is not necessarily bad, right? But everyone who actually takes the time out to listen to the show or watch the video, they all like it. So it's a good choice. It's a good there's a good possibility, good possibility. If you watch those videos, you will like it too. So please check us out. Yeah, I mean, I, and I'll give it to you. I mean, I've, you know, bench watched um, a lot of the episodes and they're actually, I mean, I, I'll give you a due. They're, they're really good. Your co-host, you know, it, uh, knows their stuff. and Because um, he comes at it from a different side. He was a trained professional wrestler. Yeah, and you, and you, th and you most people are like, well, why the hell do I want to listen to somebody talk about video? It's, you don't talk about the game the whole. You talk you talk about current stuff. You talk about different things. It's not like it's just you're just talking about what you're seeing. No, on the, on I mean the screen, we'll do so. we'll do. Here's the thing about wrestling video games, right? When I do the actual review shows, because we do review wrestling, we'll review them all, every single one that was ever ever made. Um, and how many is that? Uh, thousands. Like a, I picked that topic because I wasn't going to run out of videos. Yeah purposely here's the thing though in reviewing wrestling video games especially the older ones you can only talk for about five or six minutes because there's not a whole lot there if you want to talk about pro wrestling on like the atari or you know body slam on the television there's not there's not a whole lot there to talk about it's fucking the video game from 1983 so we will pivot into a related topic so for example when we did like super wrestlemania we talked about our favorite WrestleMania moments. We talked about, you know, uh, we did a video on uh, WCW Mayhem. We talked about the latter stages of WCW, concluding with the actual pay-per-view name Mayhem. So, like, so I wanted to extend these videos because what I saw in the in the marketplace in the space was that we would get these video game review shows on wrestling, and it would be, you know, five or six minutes. You get to see some footage on there, but you wouldn't see necessarily a full playthrough or full matches and just to really get an in-depth look at, at these games here. So I chose to figure out a way to extend up to 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, what have you, uh, as long as we can talk about the topic, to give the people a, a greater sense of, like, this is what the game looks like. you know? Because we would see other videos, too, of full playthroughs, but there's no commentary on it, which is fine. I do that sometimes, too. But... I really want to get into these games because I have a collection of, I collect wrestling video games is what I do. You know, I have other video games as well, but that's what I collect. I collect those particular games. So I have them all just about, and you know, we'll go through the process. I just picked up a uh, King of Coliseum uh, red. I have green. I got red now. So it's a pretty dope game. Oh, PlayStation two. I just, I mean, if you folks, if you, if you ever want to uh, know more about wrestling video game, just, video games in general just you know just subscribe and like he like you like alex has said every each and every time that we talk about it he doesn't care if you like him disagree with him just comment on it i mean just say it's something. hard to disagree with me on a lot of these topics because i come from a like a place like oh, i can see that yeah like very often 
people will tell me I'm wrong very often about like an opinion I have. Like they may agree or disagree with me, but they never say my opinion is wrong or or the facts are fucked up. It's just these are the facts. It's pretty black and white, and then you take an opinion from there. A lot of people being intellectually disingenuous out there in the social media world, but the facts have remained exactly the same. You can't change the facts on it. You can make your opinion based on the facts and either go right, left, center, up, down, whatever you want to go from there. The problem is, is when people start changing the facts. Yeah. And, uh, and they're like, they're you're, you're, you're being disingenuous on purpose. And I don't think that's right. No. Social media is fucked up. Anyway. Yeah, no. It's, it's well, make sure you follow me on Twitter at uh, Our Debut Games Presents. Yeah, I mean, how many people how many... Don't, don't get mad at me because I don't say fucking inflammatory shit for no reason. No, no. And how many uh, people do you have up that um, follow you on the Twitter machine? Oh, like 1,500? It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's... I get like four or five a day. Yeah. Some people I um, like, I usually follow back until they say something stupid. I'm not stupid, like, hey, add this opinion like when you say something ridiculous and then i don't follow you i don't block it i just don't follow you yeah and speaking of something that's not ridiculous this next match was for the united states championship the champion the natural dustin rhodes taking on legend in the making steve austin these two legends went at it for the u.s title 1993 halloween they had good matches they had really great chemistry steve austin and dustin rhodes yeah now, I'm one of the few people that actually prefer selling Steve Austin over Stone Cold Steve Austin. I was actually quite upset when they changed his gimmick when he went to the WWF. I think him and Cactus Jack, and even and even Dustin to a certain degree, I'm like, why can't it just be Dustin Rhodes, selling Steve Austin, and Cactus Jack in the WWF? Yeah. it's. But I think it really hurt. He came in as a fucking ringmaster and shit. And then he was, you know, he, then eventually he was Stone Cold. He was still the million dollar champion, but it was ridiculous. Like, like, 95 wasn't a good year for, for Steve Austin in the WWF, but if he would have just came in as stunning Steve Austin, I think he would have got traction a lot faster. Because yeah. he's such a great fucking heel, I think people don't see it. Yeah, I mean, he definitely, I mean, he had great chemistry with Vince McMahon, I mean, the whole feud with him, and yeah. it just, I mean, he was great, and, 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 and you know, kind of a... a, a, a uh, a uh, advertisement for his uh, new series that he has on the network. I mean, this it, it some great sit downs. It's got the Undertaker, it's got uh, Kane, um, Glenn Jacobs on there. I mean, a couple others. I think I haven't watched all of them all, but yeah. I mean, it's just he's. I mean, people listen to him and people love him, and but they will boo him. I mean, he's a great heel. He's a great baby face. He's just a great all time wrestler. He's great on the microphone. I mean. Like I want, I want people. People don't understand how good he got in such a short period of time. Like he debuted what late eighty nine, ninety. And if you watch him with that early USWA stuff, what he's feuding with like Chris Adams, with 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 Tony Adams and Jimmy Clark, and 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 all that, like you see how good he was so fucking early. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, he was, I mean... Yeah. Stupid good. Yeah, I mean, he debuted in 19... And Dustin, and Dustin Rhodes, like, nope. when they call him the natural, he's the fucking natural. He also debuted in, what, 1989. So these guys are not, you know, this 19, they're like four years in. Five and, years into their career. And they're already that good. That fucking good. There's guys on NXT right now that who are 35 years old and have been doing this for fucking 15 years. Yeah, and it's and and you know the natural Dustin Rhodes is still wrestling and he's still good. Still I mean, good. Still I good. mean he still puts over you know people. I mean he's you know. I would have made him WWF World Champion like four years ago. By the way, I would have done this whole like comeback, one last ride for 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 Goldust, aka uh, Dustin Rhodes. I had this whole gimmick in my head. Yeah, it ends up him getting murdered by some old Joe, but still. It's funny. How, it's funny how he can call himself the natural Dustin Rhodes, but Cody cannot use his last name, which is I, I know that he WWE, says he can, but now he decides like he now he's being spiteful and doesn't use it. He, I know Justin Roberts is always like, you know, Brandy and Cody Rhodes. It's just like, no, it's it's Cody and Brandy Rhodes. That's what I just said. What do you think yeah. I just said? Jeez. That's the other way. Yeah, whatever. Brandy uh, has big titties. And yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. I mean, I don't think that's like me being a fucking 
like, hey, I'm a gross misogynist. No, no you're that's, just that's, obser- just that's that's literally fact. You're just ob- you're very ob- uh, you're very um observant. Yeah, I mean, a- I wouldn't walk up to her at a bar. I'm like, you got big titties. You would do and the would say, You would do the as old- an observationalist. I'm like, she got some honkers there. You would do Good the old. You. Bo- you would do the old motorboat. I mean, I can think about it, but I think Cody would have a problem with it. So. Well, he would have a problem, and I'm sure that someone. And he's like the nicest dude in the world. I've met him, and he is awesome. Yeah, I mean, and you know, speaking of uh, AEW, going to be, going to be going um, to AEW next Wednesday night, um, a week from this airing of uh, Halloween Havoc. You should try to get press credentials. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to get some uh, some backstage access. Um, we'll see, we'll see how that happens. But um, it's funny speaking of. It, it's weird. Okay. So, you know, I never get anything in the mail because, you know, most things are done online, but I got a very special package in the mail. It was from Canada. Porno magazine? No, I get the, I, I subscribe to those online. It was from Canada. It was from our buddy PCO. Oh, yes. And, uh, Ring of Honor World Champion PCO. Yes. And he has given me two shirts to give away, which I'm going to be giving away in the next couple of weeks. It's PCO Monster Mania running wild on you. And on the back, it says, that's my monster. It's two nice. t-shirts, one XL, one large, going to be uh, doing a give it away. But he's going to be uh, kind of a tease. He said he's going to be coming back, doing some NWA stuff. I know he was one half of the NWA World Tag Team Champions, and he's just a, a great gimmick. I mean, he's, do, do you think they're going to do the title versus title? All yeah. this the PCO? I, I think so. The Headington? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a fucking Nick Aldis fan. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I like him so much. I don't know. I just, he just seem. He's another one of those guys that I've heard is a, like a really nice guy, really nice dude. But uh, the guy who kind of annoys me is uh, Tim Storm. Not a big fan of Tim Storm. You have a big fan of Tim Storm? Not particularly, no. No, he's terrible. But, I'm not saying he's terrible. He works hard. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, he's a teacher too, so I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, he's no Marcus Alexander Bagwell, that's for sure. God, who? I mean, God, I, I remember uh, being next to him at. Uh, a graduation from Sprayberry High School? No, at WrestleCon. Yes, at Spray. No, I've never been to Sprayberry fucking high school. I mean, I know a lot of people that went to Sprayberry. You used to pick up chicks there when you were twenty-five. What are you talking about? Hey, you know, hey, don't judge me, okay? Don't you ever seen those guys back in the day? You know, if you were a certain age, you remember seeing those guys that were like 21, maybe 20, like picking up like their 17-year-old girlfriend from high school. You guys remember that? You remember looking at those guys like, what a piece of shit. And a couple of years later, you do the same thing. Yeah, and yeah, and there's people who are probably saying, look at that old man. I'm like, dude, I'm only 21 and you're 20. Uh, you're old, but that's but that's beside the point. Why do you have a Trans Am? <laughs> oh, God. The next match we had on the card was another. I've noticed that the, a lot of the, the the titles are on the line in this pay per view, which is good. We've we've covered a lot of pay per views that don't have any titles on the line. This is for the WCW World Tag Team Championships. The Nasty Boys, Brian Knobs, Jerry Sags, Uncle Jerry Sags, with as Jesse Ventura called her. Can you imagine? Could you imagine the fucking Thanksgiving at the Rhodes' house where you have Uncle Fred and Uncle Jerry? Fucking. Bizarre. No, but the 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 uh, bang them hanging out there too. It's well, weird. yeah, the 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 uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas that I would love to be a, love to be a fly on the wall is Conrad Thompson. He's fucking married to Ric Flair's daughter. I mean, he's 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 the uh, soon to be um, Andrade is going to marry Charlotte, and they're going to be related. It's just he's just like. Stupid lucky. I mean, he's talented. He's living the dream, by the way. He's fucking so, talented, but he's just fucking stupid fan, lucky. As a wrestling fan, he is living. I I think most of us fantasize to to reach that level. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, in terms of being a wrestling fan, being involved in professional wrestling, getting in through the side door, not even the back door, just through the side door. You know, imagine being a kid and like I ah, like Ric Flair, and then you like becoming one of his best friends. Like my man's living the dream. So, what, you know, I've met Conrad, super nice guy. I met him and Bruce, and like I know a lot of people give him shit for stuff, and and you know, some of his shows can be a little sticky, a little bit, a little a little sticky, a lot of ads in there, but you know, he does a phenomenal job. I enjoy his product. I enjoy his show. 
I don't know if I would buy a mortgage for him, but you know, overall, in terms of his wrestling-related uh, products, I, I do, I do enjoy him, and I can't even be mad at the guy, man. He's fucking living the dream. Yeah, one thousand percent. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's definitely living the every wrestling person's dream. I like mean, his belt collection and his, 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 like he can open up a museum. Like his, his, the stuff that he has is fucking, fucking dope. I mean, if you ever get those six man titles from uh, Tony, who says they're in their his attic, you know. I, mean, I wonder if he, I wonder if he got the boots from the Bunkhouse Stampede. We've been looking for the boots. Yeah, I mean, he seems to uh, have a lot of connections. I mean, hey, fuck, when you're fucking following all is Ric Flair, I mean, and you have some, some. One of his roles. Yeah, but he I mean, was doing like, that shit before. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Like, but he's a rich dude, you know. Where, you know, owns his mortgage company, and yeah, and, and now, now he does. That's, that's the dream, man. Like, you know what? Make a million dollars and then be a wrestling fan. That's the way to go. And, and speaking of overzealous wrestling fans, did you hear about the fan who attacked MJF? Yeah, wasn't that Frank Gazarian? I don't know. Posing as a fan. I. It could have been. That's uh, a, I, you know, a lot of people are saying that as a plant. I don't know. Maybe. Well, but, if it wasn't, that's that's good heat. I mean, but, can't get heat. But all I know is that uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine on uh, uh, the other day. I'm surprised you have friends. Hey, I have a lot of friends. Ah, you sure? I mean, I pay him they're to be a, my friends. They're friend. not imaginary. They're not, you're not picking him up on the corner at three o'clock in the morning. No, I can't even. I can't. Speaking of ice trains, there he comes through your hey, neighborhood. Ice train coming right through. I mean, no, I can't even have imaginary friends. I'm that. I'm that lame. But that's beside the point. Speaking of this things that's not lame. Well, sorry. Marcus Alexander Bagwell, too cold Scorpio. They were talking about Missy Heights today's. But can you can you imagine that they were the fucking world tag team champions? Who Marcus f- Bagwell and Two Cold Scorpio. Yeah. No, I cannot. Who the fuck? Just like I cannot fathom the fact that Marcus Bagwell and the Patriot were also tag team champions. Who thought that was a good idea? I don't know. I mean, you're trying to do something with Two Cold Scorpio because it's awesome. Obviously, Marcus Alexander Bagwell is a talent for the future here. Kind of put them together, see if anything works here. Uh, unfortunately, it did not work here at all. They didn't even get along. They. Those are two guys that have like have tons of heat with each other. They don't like each other. Um, nasty boys, you know. I like the nasty boys. Like, does anyone like other than their TNA stuff at the end? Like, nasty boys were were a fun tag team. Like, like they had cool matches in the WWF, former WWF World Tag Team Champions. I believe they're the AWA World Tag Team Champions too, if I'm not mistaken. They're also WCW Tag Team Champions. So. They're well fucking recognized tag team. They're highly uh, decorated. They did that one of my favorite matches of all time at Halloween Havoc '90 with the Steiner Brothers. That match was fucking dope. And I think Missy was. I don't think Missy liked being a manager for the Nasty Boys, but I thought she was a good fit, a good fit. And then you know, it's funny because on uh, the announcing it says escorted by Missy Missy Hyatt. So again, they were playing up the fact that she was a prostitute. I mean. Like I said, a spade is a spade. And this, and this is around the time where her titty does pop out, and then they post pictures of it all over the office at WCW. And then she uh, filed a sexual harassment lawsuit and won. And then that was basically the end of Misty Hyatt, other than a couple of shots in WC, and, uh, ECW. That was it. Yeah. And, I mean, and it's just one of those people who does, does not really like to be on podcasts or shows. because No, because everyone thinks she's an idiot, and she's actually – Extremely intelligent and very knowledgeable about the wrestling business. Like, stupidly knowledgeable. Like, she probably should have a podcast. I mean, she. I think the only smarter person than her is you, I think. No. Okay. No, she's way smarter than me. She actually made money at this. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we, we should all be making money at this, but, I mean, alas, we're not. But that's... I got some side boob action when, when she put her arm around me at, at uh, WrestleCon. That was pretty good. Oh, my God. Keep it in your pants, buddy. Keep it in your pants. It's hard. I bet you. Oh, I, oh, I bet you it is. I bet you it is. It's not my fault. I'm, um, I am of uh, Hispanic descent. So, so, yeah. I apologize. I, I, on that, on that awkward, um, really weird note that I'm going to be talking true. about human it's resources true. about, uh, Sting, Sid Vicious. It was in between Sid Vicious's uh, softball tournaments. Uh, he took on Sting. 
This is what I don't understand about this match, by the way. Sid loses, but then he earns a shot at the world title at the next pay-per-view, which he doesn't because he stabs Art Anderson with scissors. But <laughs> regardless of that, he gets beat by Sting, but gets the world title match against Vader. It's fucking ridiculous. And this is also a rematch from the Halloween Havoc 1990 match, which had the fake Sting in there as Barry Windham. I mean, are you were you a fan of Vicious Seditious? Yes! Psycho yes, Sid. main event or bust. Main Psych- event or bust. Psycho he should Sid. be in all the main events. No, he should not. I like Psycho Sid. I like... He got over everywhere, dude. That's the bottom line. He got over in, in early 90s WCW, went to WWF, got over there. Came back, got over here again. Went back to the WWF on numerous occasions and got over again. He got over at USWA. Hell, he got over in the ECW when he came in for those shots. Yeah, I mean, and I'm a fan of Sting back then. I mean, this is pre Crow gimmick. It's just like, I don't know. It's just like, it. I'm, Sting I think it still has a little bit left in the tank in terms of this character. Now, by 1985, the character needed to change. Now, they need to change it to the Crow? Probably not. But changes had to be made um, because he's basically running out of steam here with his gimmick. He's been there since 1986. Yep. And, I mean, I remember him. He was the that great match with him and Ric Flair at Clash 1. That was... I and Sting was, had great matches with a lot of people. He had great matches with Rude. He had great matches with Vader. Obviously, he had great matches with Flair. So I think a lot of people give him shit for his work. Um, and there is the big difference between post uh, knee surgery thing and pre knee surgery thing. Uh, he was doing a lot more athletic stuff, you know, before that injury. Like if you look at 1989 thing and 1993 thing, they're a little bit different. But I think overall, it's fucking Sting. He's fucking awesome. Yeah, he's he's probably my favorite wrestler at the time. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I definitely, uh, I definitely, um, what well, well, you know, was a fan of his. The, the, this next match we had on the card was for the WCW International World Heavyweight Championship. Rick, or, uh, Rick Rude, the champion, taking on the nature boy, Ric Flair. I love Rude wearing this belt. He looks so good wearing the actual belt. Now, the match is really fucking good. The finish is a little wonky with the, the way they did it with the with the foreign object and the referee not seeing it but then seeing it and then playing it sneak cute kind of wonky here but again you don't hurt flair by this finish you don't even know that he's going to be in the main event in the next pay-per-view anyway so you kind of like yeah you kind of like yeah but root here is, is fantastic i love 1993 1994 rick root they had really good matches even though they didn't get along so yeah i mean it flair i mean i'm just i will always be a fan of uh you know of uh, of him. I mean, doesn't matter what he does. I'll always be. I mean, oh, I think the big thing that we missed. Uh huh. Hello. I think the big thing that we missed uh-huh. in and WCW due to Rick Rude's injury was babyface Rick Rude. It looked like he was going to turn on Vader. Never really got anywhere with that. Yeah, I mean, it looks like that was the direction they were going, and I believe. I would say the later half of 1994, we would have saw Rick Rude as a babyface, which would have been amazing because the only time he's ever been a babyface was like in Memphis for like a week and a half. That was it. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a good match. I mean, it was no, uh, I mean, what were your thoughts? I mean, going into the main event, uh, Vader, Cactus Jack, Texas Death Match. First of all, I'm shocked this is even the main event because I love Cactus to death. But I don't think anywhere in 1983 had him as a main eventer. But his matches with Vader were fucking so fucking insane that I guess you have to put him on last. Yeah. You know, Vader is the world champion at this point. Although all of the belts on the line here, probably not. You know, Spin the Wheel make the deal. I don't know why they went with uh, Call Him Under Glove the year before, but we got a Texas Death match here, which is really good. And the bumps in this match are fucking nuts. And there's some bumps here that you will never, ever see again. But the, 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 just the physicality and brutality of this match, it's fucking off the fucking charts. And it's a shame that, you know, by the time we get into the middle of 1994, they got nothing for Cactus. Like, he was main eventing Halloween Havoc not too long before this. And now you, you don't have anything for him, and he ends up going to WWF as Mankind? Ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's I mean... But I mean, overall, I mean, what would you, 
what would you give the rating of this show? I mean, oh, this is a four a four star show show for sure. Um, yeah, it's fucking like I highly recommend. Like, go back and watch this fucking show. Like, shut, like we should shut the fuck up and just go go to the WWE Network and go watch this fucking show. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, I mean, and, and speaking of you know of shows that you should watch on YouTube. It's the next show that we're going to be covering next week. We're going to be covering Collision in Korea. I mean, your thoughts on that before we uh, before we head to the house and uh, and wrap up another week of uh, the Retro Wrestling Rewind. Wrestling in North Korea. There's a couple of interesting stories here about uh, Ric Flair having to say anti-American things during a press conference that he wouldn't say. Um, this the whole the whole concept of. Um, Anoki going into North Korea because he was mad at, I guess, the Japanese government for some reason. And, you know, hey, we have Flair versus Anoki in the main event, which a match I don't think has happened before that because NWA was mostly closely associated with all Japan. So that's an interesting matchup. You get to see some Dynamite Kid action in there. I mean, uh, some Dynamite Kid. What the fuck? Uh, Chris Benoit, uh, before he really kind of uh, kicks off in WCW. And this is a weird pay-per-view. It's essentially a New Japan pay-per-view with uh, WCW commentary on it with Mike Tanay, Eric Bischoff, and Sonny Ono. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was uh, it, it was definitely, definitely a good show. But um, for the great Alex G, as always, I am David Fine. We will see you back here next week where we go international. So get your passports uh, ready. We are going to talk about Collision in Korea next week right here on the retro wrestling rewind and as always we'll talk to you in the past